everybody. I'm Ben Lee. Welcome to this first episode of a new podcast series called On the Future of Being a Musician. This podcast series is going to be my personal exploration of conversations that are happening behind the scenes and need to be happening more widely in our community, in our artistic community, in our business community, in our cultural community, about what the future actually looks like, how we're going to have any kind of sustainable experience uh, as artists in this changing landscape as far as technology, the finances behind that, AI. I mean, it's an amazing time to be a musician. I, for one, am actually quite optimistic and hopeful about the role that all of this tech and advancement can play in true artistry, but I do think it raises a lot of very complex concerns both in terms of what our role is as artists and how we're going to be compensated for that in the future. There's also a lot of conversations we need to be having around live touring and the increasing cost of that and what that could actually look like for us as artists in the future. So look, this might be a little bit inside baseball. It it might be a series that is more relevant to people who are in the music industry or music industry adjacent. But those are the people I want to be reaching in this. And I think we are only going to solve these problems if we start talking more widely about them and more transparently about them. Because look, a world where there is lots of good music being made is good for everybody. So I see this as something that we, in a way, as even music fans, we all have a vested interest in musicians being able to solve some of these problems that we're currently facing. I'm not going to put this podcast out on like a regular schedule. It's really going to be when I find someone I want to talk to that I think has a viewpoint that I want to deep dive into a little bit. I'll put out an episode. So I would say just subscribe to this pod. It'll come up when it comes up. And honestly, I'd love you guys to reach out if there's any ideas of people that you'd like to hear on this podcast. They don't have to be people I agree with. I I really want to do this to learn and to sort of spark conversation. So you can reach out at weirdertogetherpod at gmail.com and clue me in on anyone you think would be great to have on here. Anyway, I wanted to start this series with an old friend of mine, Tom Gray, who a lot of people know from the band Gomez. As you'll hear Tom talk about, they became big during the kind of last gasp of the traditional music industry, which was actually the biggest year. I think the year they won the Mercury Prize, he says, was the biggest year for CD sales in the history of music. So it was kind of an interesting moment to come in. But he's since become a real musician activist and advocate for asking for a closer examination of the way royalty rates work for streaming sites. And I've just really appreciated, I follow him on Twitter and I've watched everything he did with the Broken Record campaign and just a super interesting, intellectual, politically minded musician. So I thought it'd be a great place to start because it gives a very broad sense of some of the issues that are being faced today. So as a jump off point, so, uh, Here we go. Let's jump in. This is my chat with Tom Gray. Hello, Tom. Hello, Ben. (laughs) Let me tell you a little bit about why I've got you on this call today. Yeah, sure. So I'm living in Los Angeles at the epicenter of this writer's strike that's happening amongst uh, screenwriters and moving into directors and actors. And it's incredibly effective. Look, whether or not they get all their demands met, the conversations are being had about where their art meets commerce and technology. And they're they're having the conversation. They're doing it as a city. They're doing it with their opponents or adversaries or collaborators. You know, they're, they're doing it. And it made me think about how there's a real absence of conversation being had amongst our community about how we're going to adapt as musicians in the next, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 years and what it means to be a musician. So what I wanted to do was do a little podcast series on the future of being a musician where I'm going to talk to half a dozen people. Who knows? Maybe it'll go on if there's more people who have thoughts to share. But I've been following you. We first met, you were playing in Gomez and we did some touring together and had mutual friends. And then I've been following everything you've been doing as an activist, as a musician activist. And I, you were the natural first guest I wanted to talk to about how you perceive both the challenges 
and the opportunities of being a musician in the current era. So does that make sense why I reached out? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And um, it's very nice to be asked. I, uh, you know, this is, it's been kind of, it started off as something that I kind of got involved in about a decade ago, and it's slowly overtaken my life now to the point where I'm not sure whether I'm a musician or an activist. <laughs> so these days, yes, it seems like uh, most of what I do is focused on that question very particularly. And uh, the, the, all the questions that you're asking, really. And, you know, even though I'd been working behind the scenes in, in, in sort of organizations that work for musicians like the Musicians Union in the UK and the Ivers Academy, who are the British Association of Songwriters and Composers, um, I was always helping them with policy and stuff because I had a background in politics. Um, but it wasn't until COVID that I kind of went into sort of hyper mode. And kind of because you know, probably the same as you, all of my buddies were calling me up and saying, "I don't know, I'm going to pay for nappies. I don't know how I'm going to afford the next mortgage instalment if I can't go and play a show." Right, 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 right. And and also the touring. I mean, this is a another part of the conversation, but touring costs have gotten so high. I'm thinking about for you guys, Gomez as a band. It was always a crew of how many people were on the road? Like at least ten, right? Ten or eleven, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that that type of tour at that level would have been a basically profitable enterprise, you know, a decade ago. Whereas now bands at that level are being convinced the way we were with streaming that, ah, oh, this is basically a non-profit enterprise. Do it as promotion. You'll be on everyone's Instagram stories. It's a, How's know, that supposed so I, to work? How's, how does yeah, any yeah, of yeah. this work? I mean, this is the, the other problem, you know, I, and I speak to music venues and all of these different... Um, stakeholders for want of a better word and uh you know they're all really struggling because you know energy costs are through the roof and uh business rates are through the roof and so yeah it's easy to hit the talent it's easy to squash the talent for for income because uh you know we're not organized labor so we don't have the protections of a wga uh we are just subject to you know, the power that we've managed to retain through our celebrity, through yeah, just our cultural capital, basically. cultural capital, our yeah, ticket yeah. value, you know, you, I mean, this isn't, you, this is, I mean, some people listening won't know this, but that's really all we trade on, right? That's, that's it. Exactly. And that's now been, uh, that's now been quantified as basically social media followers or Spotify streams. You've got some hard data now, some numbers and that, people can translate that into a, a price that you're worth and that's that's what you got yeah exactly right so i mean but then that's a kind of that's a false economy as well isn't it really this is the big the big problem is that social media and streaming in particular have don't really tell you about people who genuinely are going to part ways with money for a ticket so there's this huge distortion in the systems which which uh, remunerate us and the data being in any way useful to us, right? This is the real, a lot of the stuff that I've dealt with uh, with Broken Record Campaign um, basically comes down to this point, which is that, you know, obviously in any system where you remunerate creators, there's going to be winners and losers, right? There's going to be. There's, we sadly we do live in a capitalist society, and it's a jungle. It's a jungle, and not every kid with a kazoo is going to be able to make a living, right? Look, as musicians, we all accepted that we're gamblers, mm -hmm. so we, I think we're inherently comfortable with that. Every time we write a song or record something, we're taking a swing, right? We're swinging for that, and we're okay with that. But we do like to know what the rules of the game are that we're playing, <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. right. So you know, if you get to the sort of root cause of a lot of the issues that we have at the moment, almost all of them come back to this thing called the pro rata um, uh, distribution system. And basically what happens in streaming and what happens in YouTube and what happens in TikTok and, and any of these social media uh, um, platforms, they effectively just do a, 
whatever new share licensing agreement with whoever, Universal or like your CMO, like as ASCAP or PRS in the UK or whoever. And they basically go, we're going to put all the money in a big bucket. And we know that a certain percentage of that money belongs to Universal or ASCAP. And then we go, and then they cut that money up and then they divide it up and they say, we'll do a deal with you on that money and we'll pay it out to you. So then it's just all of the total streams, all of that puddle of money divided by the total streams that goes to the rights holders or the CMOs. And, and so then it's up to the labels to carve it up? Well, yeah. I mean, they get all them. They, they have all their data and they have all of the money, right? So, but there's, there's so many levels of problem. There's so many issues in this in terms of transparency because, you know, you don't know whether you're getting paid the same as another artist. You don't, you know what your percentage is, which might be lower than another artist, but you don't know if the rate is the same, right? Because yeah. I remember hearing rumors. I don't know if they're real, but I heard a lot of bigger artists. There were rumors going around that like Foo Fighters or Taylor Swift were cutting independent deals with the streamers or with their labels. I'm not sure who it was, but it was for a more favorable rate. Of course, right? And also, if you're really big, you get yourself into a renegotiation position with your label where effectively you're just really licensing your masters. You're no longer in a kind of label artist classic arrangement. You kind of have all the power. I mean, again, you have so much cultural capital. But the, the, this is the thing is the reason why these few artists have become so powerful is because the pro rata system makes huge winners and loads and loads of losers, right? It is, it is a, that the curve is a, is a flat line that ends in a very tall spike, right? And that's the problem of pro rata because a, an algorithmic system that just keeps playing things that people already like again and again to them will end up playing the same artists again and again and again, right? That's what it does it pulls you back to something that other people already like. That's how it works, right? So it's a system that games you to make the winners even bigger winners. Whereas, you know, back in the days when we were like selling albums, you could, there was a classic thing, you know, if you're an artist and you've got 10,000 fans, you can have a career because you can sell 10,000 physical records directly yourself. That's going to pay for you, for your, you know, that's going to cover you. That's fine. That That's meaningless now. 10,000 people in streaming is an utterly meaningless number of people. Um, even if they listen to you, you know, a hundred times a month, you know, that's still only whatever. Well, let's a million just, let's plays, just, which is not going to pay anything. Yeah. Yeah. But let's just clarify that as musicians, we don't believe 10,000 listeners to our music is meaningless inherently. We actually love having 10,000 listeners. Oh. It's just oh. the way we're being compensated for <laughs> Sorry, it. Yeah, no, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying that the system perceives 10,000 <laughs> yeah. people as yes. being meaningless. That, 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 yeah, that yeah. is not a figure that has any viable value within the system. Now, that's crazy. That's truly crazy. We've built a thing which effectively breaks down culture. The, the remuneration system is dissociative right it, it is it is left behind the connection between fans and music and the way that audiences get built right and there are all kinds of effects of this it isn't just how we earn money if you speak to any label at any a and r at any label anywhere on the planet they cannot break a new artist they can't do it anymore right it's impossible and that is fucked I mean, that is so fucked on an elemental level. They don't even, they're, they're all going, I don't know why. I don't know why. And it's like, guys, let me tell you why. You, you don't, aren't in the business of building audiences anymore. All you are in the business of is gambling on the number of spins you get because all, every spin is, is equal. And that's crazy because right? every spin is not equal, right? If I listen to five minutes of a track that I love, that pays out the same as somebody listening to 31 seconds of a track that they, mm. they, they got played to them by an algorithm. I remember How hearing, they, yeah, Dan, uh, is it Auerbach? Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys. He was proposing the idea that there should be certain listeners whose spins are actually weighted more heavily in the algorithm, <laughs> meaning if you're a serious music fan or a, if you're a tastemaker, that your spin actually yeah. should have more value because it's a more curate, it's a, it's a refined taste that's going to affect culture more. You know, it's kind of, it's a theory. <laughs> totally. I mean, the, the big problem at the moment is that effectively hyper listeners. So people you can from a, so for, say from, from a $10 Spotify subscription, only around five of that will go to music after you take out tax and everything else. Um, of that five bucks, 
um, one person can extract, you know, $40 worth of listening, right, from five bucks because they can listen constantly every day while they're awake. If they, if they, if they leave it playing while they're asleep as well, they can probably extract 80 bucks. I don't know. But, it's, but, but what's crazy is everybody else is subsidizing that listening. Now, the problem with Dan's position is that we can't differentiate with people who are choosing things sensibly and people who are just leaving it playing, right? We, there's no way of doing that. And as much as uh, it was great when we had gatekeepers um, uh, in culture that could help us see the thing, the wood from the trees, right? The problem that we've got is that those same gatekeepers were also full of prejudices and other issues. So it led to like black music being stifled. It led to all kinds of other problems. So gatekeeping goes two ways. It's a, it's a two way swinging filter. So you, I'm always a little bit mm, careful when we start talking about gatekeeping. And every gatekeeper has a price. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. And it's usually a Ferrari. So the, but, <laughs> so, so the, the point is, is that you can just, you, you, for me, it's like there's a much better system of payment, and it's often referred to just by its initials UCPS, which is user-centric payment system, which means, which is what most people think it already does, but it doesn't, is just your $10 goes to the music that you listen to. It just splint, it just breaks up based on what you listen to. And then, there, you know, there will be winners and losers, just the same as there are now, but having... 10,000 hardcore fans for one artist will be financially meaningful. As far as you know, how have the streamers responded to that concept? Has it been presented officially to them? Is there has oh, it been many the times? Deezer tried to do it for years, but um, Sony prevented them from doing it. Um, and the reason being that in it appears in user centric, um, more money will go to local music in in regional countries. So Deezer was based in France that was trying to do this, and Sony had far more international repertoire than French repertoire. So they were worried that they were going to lose out, right? And of course, all these, all of these, the reason why revenue share makes so much sense to these huge multinational corporations in 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 the music industry is because their whole world is based on market share. So their 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 share value in the world. What they're trying to do for their share value is gain market share. That's really the only game they're in. They want a number one because that's more market share. They want, you know, they're buying up all of the independent distributors because they want to keep market share. That's their raison d'etre, right? It's, it's a sort of, it's psychotic, uh, like a lot of big corporate sort of capitalist. Um, you know, if, if most corporations were a person, they'd be, they would be. Um, you know, um, psychopaths, you know, they, that's what they are. They, they just eat the world and have no um, feelings. So, so this is, this is where we, we are. So very simply, you say to them, you might lose out in this, then they will resist it. And of course, any corporation really just wants to get to a place where they feel comfortable and safe and know how to account. And there isn't any variations in that. And it's very simple and you know, there's very little friction in the way they do the licensing deals because it's so simple. It's just like a big deal and we chop it up in this simple way and everyone gets paid and great, right? It, our market share is reflected in how we get paid. Hooray for us. So user-centric is a hard sell. But they, we are getting to a sort of a moment historically where even they are going, oh, crap. Do we pretend to be companies that are in the business of making making music into the future or do we just cut our losses and sit on our catalog and keep selling that forever because mm. the business of making new music is becoming so hard because of the the systemic changes that they have played a part in that they have kind of walked themselves into for frictionless financial reasons but are actually really bad for cultural reasons right so that, that it's kind of like a it's it, it, they've been off their own nose and, and, and now they're kind of going, oh, wait a minute. You know, what happened to the ability to develop artists, make new records, break them in the world? That was what we did. 
right? Mm. And and but now you see since streaming, who have been the big, you know, the the stadium fillers have been the same people for over a decade, right? The Ed Sheerans, the Taylors, the you know those the Adels, you know who who's come along to challenge that firmament since streaming came along not many artists let's be honest i mean the huge huge big artists global hip-hop artists and uh, come to light and maybe here and there but like we're not looking you know the biggest the biggest selling ticket in the uk at the moment is beyonce right (laughs) when did beyonce start 1996 right it's like man that's crazy we've got a problem and that's just top level that's just cultural but it's so much of this stuff is that if you fix it weirdly, it starts to help the little guy as well. Because it, if you start kind of going, well, we need more of a bottom up system that is about sorting the sort of cultural breakage that we have, everything else starts to look a lot better. And user centric is just one solution. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Pro, pro rata, pro rata comes from radio, right? So they've done it in radio forever. One spin on the radio pays out, but but radio, right? And they started doing this in the 1950s. They had the good sense to do two other things with their pro rata system. So it was per play, but it was also based on duration. So if the track's longer, you get paid more. Anyone who's anyone who's written a song and been paid by a, a PRO knows this. The, the, the longer the song got played, the more you got paid, right? And also audience size. So the time of day you got played or the audience share. So if there was 5 million people listening when your song played for five minutes, you got paid at a much higher rate than if you played at night when there's only 500,000 people listening, right? Now, those variations on the pro rata system are massively, again, connected to culture because, they, because, because in, this is the problem in the pro rata system as it stands. A thousand people listening once has the same value as one person listening a thousand times. Now, that's mad because a thousand people listening to you once and they're never listening to you again is meaningless. Whereas one person listening to you a thousand times means everything to an artist. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and that's, that's the problem we've got. We've detached, we've, we've broken that apart. And it's crazy if you think about it. You see, as soon as you rationalize that, you go, God. Because labels just see a thousand spins and they might see some dots on a map that Spotify for artists spits at them or something. They might see some, some of the data that might give them some idea of what the market, where it's sitting, but they don't really know who the fans are. We don't know how to communicate with them. We're not allowed to communicate with them. SoundCloud actually have started user centric. They're doing it now. So they've actually, if you distribute your music through SoundCloud, they, do it user centric. So it, they've already started doing it. They've managed to license Warner's and Merlin, the big independent distributor. So there are green shoots, and of course mm. Lucian Grange, the the sort of uber mensch of the uh, of the music industry. I, I was just reading about him actually. Yeah, I mean, I know that Lucian doesn't really like me, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing for me is that I'm curiously. I meet label people, and they always think that I hate them or i'm against them or i've got a problem with them and i absolutely don't i just want them to sort it out it's not well that's the same yeah that's the same thing as like i think people assume that if you're a musician questioning streaming residuals or royalties that you're a philistine and anti-technology i love technology i'm streaming to me is a beautiful solution because i'm someone who had hundreds thousands of tapes and records and cds i don't want that crap in my house i, I love having it all come through the computer i just want to get paid properly for it you know oh, as I a mean, musician yeah 100 <laughs> percent. i mean this is the, you know the, the absolute bloody nightmare that was crate digging and finding a wreck trying to find like a copy of a of discontinued album that you'd heard about a story about you know you'd lose four or five years of your life <laughs> and it's like and now it's just click click yep got it and um, so obviously it's massively superior uh, to, 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 to what we had. But the, and it's not a Philistine thing, and it's not a Luddite thing, and it's none of these issues. It's, it's, it's really clear-eyed um, cultural criticism is what it is. Mm. It's so, not- so, you, so you're a musician. Mm-hmm. You, you're, you were very well positioned to watch this shift happening. So you like lived through it from a band that, like when Gomez won Mercury Prize, was there even 
I mean, what was that? 90s? 90, 1998 was the year. So there was, it was just the beginning of, was that Napster time? Oh, no, no. Listen to this. 1998 yeah. was the year the most CDs were ever sold on wow. planet Earth. Was that wow. year, was the year that we broke. So you, I mean, you lived through this. I want to get into what your, your personal activism looks like nowadays because i think mm -hmm. it's just been it's been amazing following it, it goes back beyond Bro broken record was a project that came out of what you were already involved in right yeah that's right yeah so give me a little give me the the the, the layman's understanding of your activism um well it probably makes me i probably have to go back to a much earlier me so 15 years of age uh i joined the labor party so always highly politicized uh always a mouthy you know, northern political uh, type on the left my whole life. Um, thought I was going to go into politics, right? That's what I was good at. That's what I knew about. Um, very naturally political person, I think. Um, and used to make music with my mates in a garage around the corner from my house, right? <laughs> and was about to go and work... Um, I was at university and I was about to go and work uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, an internship for a senator. Um, I really wanted to be a speechwriter. That's what I thought I was, you know, my love of words would lead to me doing. And, um, but then we got a phone call from a guy who'd got hold of, of a Gomez tape and basically said, I want to put out a record. And it was like, do I get on a plane to Washington or do I go on an adventure with my mates anyway here i am 27 years later <laughs> um <laughs> um yeah i didn't get on the plane um but because i'd grown up in activism and politics i knew lots of people in politics and continued to stay connected to it and continue to campaign and work on campaigns and you know never wrote political music at all was never really interested in political music um with the exception of like those first three Dylan albums, and, uh, and surely you like Billy Bragg? Oh, well, of course, Billy. Of yeah, course. yeah. Come on, come on, come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. But like, really, he gets a pass. But yeah, he totally gets a pass. But you know, political music just doesn't thrill me. Yeah. Um, I basically, you know, stayed in politics, and then when when the band started sort of winding down, uh, 2011, 2012, 2013. You know that is when the the music industry was is absolute nadir. So 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 Spotify was kicking up, but earnings were jet just on a complete downward spiral. Um, record companies were just a shed. You know, I think we, when we actually when two thousand and one, we were releasing our third album, and just as we were about to release it. EMI sacked one in five of people who worked at their company, right? Which meant at our very small label, two people got sacked of seven, right? So we, just as we're about to release our third album, the seven people who are working on it were now five, right? And that unsurprisingly fucked us, right? <laughs> Massively. And then just as we were about to release our fourth album, uh, Universal, who were then had taken over EMI, um, shut down um, our label completely, just as we were about to release our fourth album. So, so the five people who were about to work on our record ceased to exist. <laughs> so then nobody was working on our fourth album, and that was incredibly bruising. And these were people we loved and had worked with since we'd started. Um, and that's when I really was like, hmm. All is not well. I probably met you around here. We went to America and kind of turned into a touring band and really kind of like buckled down into like just hitting the stages of the United States to, to just crazy levels. I think 2004, we did 240 shows in one year. Yeah. Uh, at one and point there was an audience, but that's what's interesting. Like, because one of the criticisms people have when they hear you know, second act, third act musicians, like older people talking about, well, and then the support dried up at the, and they think, well, you just got washed up. No one cared anymore. But the live numbers, the ticket sales were telling a different story. There was an audience there. For oh, the yeah. Music. No, yeah. we, uh, we, we, at uh, one point we were in the top 30 
highest earning acts in the United States. Mm. I mean, which is bonkers. So I just like, what, how did we get here? You know, but we did because we were playing, you know, uh, certainly on the coats, we were playing like 3000 cap rooms, you know, every night. Mm. And if you do enough of them, <laughs> right. If you just do enough of them, getting through the middle was always an interesting ride, but you know, um, <laughs> but Colorado always made up for it. The, 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 <laughs> we finished a label deal with ATO in 20, um, in 2013. And we'd all had little kids and we were just like, you know what, lads, we just hang up our boots for a bit. Just we just not go and get another record contract because I'm knackered. We've been doing it for 16 years nonstop. So that's probably when I sort of went home and was look, looking after a you know, four or five year old son and just kind of reflecting on the fact that. Well, I'd gone into sort of, I'd gone into like film and TV com composition and theatre work and stuff as well. And then I'd kind of, I'd kind of reflected on the fact there weren't many people like me who had lived through all of that part of the music industry, had negotiated my own, the band's uh, record deals sometimes, had uh, a really good understanding of licensing had worked in all the other parts of the music industry as well, be it, you know, music for picture or whatever else, advertising. And if somebody like me, who had a history in politics, didn't step up and try and help things, then I wasn't sure who would. <laughs> the great calling of every activist is like, if you don't do it, no one's going to do it, basically. <laughs> I think that's basically it. I just was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I might, is like I'm, I'm massively overqualified to do this, so I should probably just bloody do it. So I started. And what did, yeah, what did that look like? You started. I joined the union. I went to what was formerly called BASCA, which was the British Association of Songwriters and Composers. I went there in 2016 to my first meeting. And went. now, were the unions? I, I only know the musicians' unions in America and Australia. There, they don't play much of a role in the average rock musician's life. The, you hear whispers of unions, but like you have no relation to them. Was it similar in the UK? Yeah, very similar. The thing for me was that they obviously represent a lot of orchestral players and session players and people who are working on film music all the time, but, you know, kind of where they can do collective rights management, uh, pit orchestras or like Broadway kind of, you know, on the West End, whatever. And um, they're, you know, that's where they do those collective bargaining type things. But for me, it was like what I found troubling and still do to some extent was how easily music creatives were divided and ruled right so songwriters were told that if you get you're not getting paid more because the artists are getting this and the artists are saying well we can't pay more to the session musicians because it's a it's this pie everyone gets told about this pie and it's like if you get more they lose right it's a zero sum you lose they win they lose it's like you see, for me, that's just bullshit. That's classic top-down divide and rule shit. And I really wanted to do something about it. So I, I, real, I kind of thought to myself, well, quite boringly, maybe you certainly not. It was strategic, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't manipulative. It was kind of like I need to probably bring these organizations together uh, in order to bring them into an alignment so that we can actually challenge um things a bit because it's so easy for the the others the, the, for the big guys to just break us apart um by saying well hey you know you win they lose you win you lose they win whatever um so i wanted to do something about that so getting involved with the union and kind of worrying about and thinking about how average musicians just players get by um was kind of an interesting necessary part of this whole process um because you know there's there's 50 or 100,000 musicians in the UK before you get to the the tiny percentage of people who are rock stars right who are yeah the featured artists <laughs> um as we like to call ourselves um and really, it's about the health of music in general for me. It's about the thing that's really been eroded is the professional class of music maker, right? And that's the best way of describing it, is people who can make a living from music. 
primarily. Mm. And um, that's what's gotten harder and harder. And if you look at all of the data, it's really thinning out. And, you know, in the UK, the average musician, person who describes themselves as a professional musician, the average income is around £20,000 a year, right? Uh, which is a very low paid uh, group of people. And most of that income comes from teaching or from second jobs in bartending or whatever else. And in fact, musicians, I think there was an American study into second professions and musicians are more than actors or photographers have second professions, right? So we are, it's what we do. But, you know, you look at what recorded music is do, playing a part in that, those in, in that income and it's tiny, it's almost nothing uh, in the average. Yet I imagine its contribution to the GDP well, exactly. is so it's, proportion, it's, it's disproportionate. Well, it's a billion quid, right? Yeah. To the UK, uh, the to UK PLC, right? So, like, how how is it possible that a billion pound industry has a workforce that are earning less than twenty thousand pounds each? It's quite shocking and mad, um, and upside down. You know, Lucian, Lucian Grange came into a lot for a lot, for a lot of criticism. He paid himself two hundred and fifty million dollars uh, last year. Um, you could pay every single musician in the UK like a check for five grand and still have half the money left over. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, you. the thing is, it's really easy to say something like this to a politician and they go, what? Right. Because these kinds of, this, these kinds of facts, these kind, this kind of data doesn't get, they just they just don't hear about it very often. They don't kind of go, oh, wait a minute. This is very curious. This is a strange industry. Especially where, where show business is, it's so glitzy from the outside that people get so glamoured by seeing Harry Styles wearing, you know, sequins on stage and just, it, it looks, it still looks like musicians are living the dream life. So it's hard to, for people to reckon with the actual reality of it. Oh, I, I mean, 100%. Yeah. I mean, when I started looking at these, this data, I think it was like Drake at the time in 2020 was the most streamed artist on the planet. And less than a third of his income was coming from recorded music. Mm. And you imagine, can you imagine that like in the 1980s? Like that would, that would just be impossible. If you were, if you were selling 20 million albums, right? Most of your income was coming from recorded music. Absolutely. You, right. So it's a very, very different world. Um, but so, so wait, I want to paint the path of your activism to be oh, like right, the sorry, mechanics yeah. of it only because I think there are a lot of musicians and people passionate about me. I was just talking to my stepdaughter who's going to be 22 and she was like, I want to work in the music industry, but in a way that actually helps musicians. And I think there is a generation of people who are looking for examples of what does it look like to get involved and change the conversation i just think i, I want to paint that out for people a little bit right so when i got to the british association of songwriters and composers it it had recently been sort of taken over by a guy called crispin hunt who's a brilliant british songwriter who was in a band um called the long pigs um and he'd really helped modernize it and make it unstuffy. So I kind of walked into a place where somebody had done quite a lot of the work already, the heavy lifting of kind of getting out the kind of scarf-wearing, blazer-wearing old songwriters of the 50s, you know, um, and modernizing it. And But he needed help with policy and strategy and... And I knew I could do that. So I just started working. Basically, we set up the policy unit there. They'd never had one before. They'd never, you know, it was all about like gentlemen's lunches and shit. You know, let's give somebody a badge for having been brilliant at writing songs or writing Rotary Club or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, but I don't want to be too mean to them because they're kind of brilliant as well. Yeah. And I'm now in charge and there's still a part of it, which is still that. And it, I wouldn't have it any different. There's a certain brilliant British kind of charm to it. But it needed to be a dynamic political organization that knew what it was about, it had intention, right? And so, and so I was then helping there for a few years, just really kind of making, putting us on a, a different footing, um, making us far more of a professional outfit in terms of, you know, bringing on off, you know, making sure that we had policy people on the staff, which had never been there and, 
uh, and then basically, you know, we got to a point with COVID. I kind of said, there's a moment here. We need to go. We need to jump now. This is the moment. We need to go at streaming now. And um, the Ivers Academy, the, the Association of Song Songwriters and Composers, weren't ready. They just didn't have the, you know, the, they weren't quick enough to be able to do it. The, the Musicians Union weren't quick enough to be able to do it as well. And and activism you know, has to be agile too. I mean, because it exactly involves right. responding and these, to the, culture. Yeah, exactly right. So these organisations are, are big, lumpy organisations with 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 governance, and decisions have to go up and down the chain of command and be, you know. And I was just like, no, there isn't time for that. So I just went straight at the. But went to Twitter and started tweeting, and it's a very curious thing because you know often you have this band as an artist where you just know you're on top of the zeitgeist, you just know you're on it, and you're just on top of it. And it's a very similar thing with activism. You know, it's a very similar thing with kind of a moment when you kind of go, oh, I really feel this moment, and I've got to just jump through that window right now. And if it, if I delay in any way, I will the window will have disappeared. And I, well, I think it's like the essence of a pop song it is like a yeah. marketing slogan where yeah. when you're able to distill a message at the right time down to the right, most concise language to the point that it's like, it's actually easier to go with it for the audience than to resist it. <laughs> that's, that's where it's similar to activism. Like you have to capture the zeitgeist and really sell the importance of this is the moment to have this conversation. Yeah, I mean, and that's what yeah. happened. It just blew up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just blew up. And then because of my old connections with politics, I was very quickly be able to go to politicians in the UK parliament and say, hey, this is blowing up. It's getting lots of national coverage. And a brilliant Welsh MP called Kevin Brennan, who is just a fantastic parliamentarian, took it to what is a select committee in parliament and said, we should look at the economics of streaming right now. So then he got this committee, which is a cross bench. It's, it's actually run by conservatives. So this, this committee is a majority conservative committee, but they, they all really love Kevin because he's just ace. And he's a songwriter as well. So it was right, mom, right man, right time. He took it to them. They went, great, let's do it. I don't think when they agreed to do that, they realized what great box office it was going to be for them. They just had no concept of that. And then I was asked to be the first person speaking at this inquiry into the economics of streaming so i came right off the back of sort of blowing up on social media to suddenly being on people's tvs talking in parliament about the problem and then when they hauled the heads of the uk labels up in front of them that's when it really went like whoa like it mm. because anyone, can, anyone listening can go back and watch this on on the british government website but it's really quite shocking because what happened was they, the, the, the label, they, I don't know who'd briefed them, but someone had made a really bad mistake and they, they didn't answer the questions straightforwardly. They sounded like they were hiding something or they sounded like they didn't know what they were, their business was about. And it did not go well for them. It like in any way, it, it was, it was highly evasive. It was, Hey man, I just love music. It was like all this stuff that's just clearly felt, um, you know, it was stretching the truth. <laughs> and, and politicians have got a nose for this shit, right? And, it, you know, it's all theater anyway. The, the questions weren't good questions. It's, it's political theater, but it made a real moment. And then the, then the wheels really started to turn because they'd fucked up, right? Um, and I, you know, that was, I, uh, that's when I became like a proper hate figure for them all because I'd kind of effectively caused this situation, which made them all look terrible. And, that was on me, <laughs> apparently. So, so that's so, when you hired private security. <laughs> well, to be, well, the brilliant <laughs> thing about COVID was it meant nobody could go outside. So the chances <laughs> of me getting kneecapped were massively reduced, right? I mean, the hidden costs to hitmen is really something that hasn't been discussed in terms of COVID. <laughs> there should have really been some very specific, you know, help to that sector. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> so yeah, I had the cover of 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 not having to ever leave my house or anyone else leaving their houses. Um, so that then got got a huge head of steam going, and at which point I then wrote to the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson 
and sort of wanted to write a letter which brought together the musicians union um my, the the broken record um movement and the songwriters and get them all on one letter asking the prime minister to sort of deal with these issues right to sort of have a look at it the report by the way came out from the committee and it was asked for a reset a complete reset of the music industry that's what they requested they said and it's a brilliant report if you read it it goes into everything it absolutely tears apart every part of the music industry and so we asked where well, i wrote this letter to boris johnson asking for a competition to markets authority to look at the british music industry asking for a different remuneration um uh, payment that's similar to radio to be paid to musicians and for all these you know and for whatever else i can't remember what else we asked for and and the idea was let's get loads more of hummus in dressing rooms more hummus in dressing rooms yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> just and, that one time and, and it was like how are we going to get lots of famous people to sign this and i was like yeah well i you know i'm just going to go straight to the mountain and i just went straight to paul mccartney and said will you sign this and he said yes amazing and then once paul mccartney had signed it mate i reckon you could get <laughs> every person on the planet to sign something once paul mccartney signed something <laughs> that's so good so like honestly like at one point it became ridiculous because i couldn't get all i was like i sent it once with 150 names on then i sent it again once i had 200 names on i was like i've got to stop it now and then i got like an angry phone call from like cat stevens like what the, why can't why am i not on your letter i was like man i can't keep sending the same letter with more names on it um so <laughs> So that would then cause an awful lot of media coverage. And to be honest with you, if Paul McCartney had known his face was going to be all over this stuff, he probably would have said no. But then every, you know, every news article had pictures of him and Chris Martin and did it, all the rest of them. You know, Kate Bush signed it. Um, it. It had a huge impact visually. And then the government basically started a process to look at creating remuneration data and transparency in payments and transparency of contracts, contract adjustment, all of these different areas that concerned us. Um, also, in amongst all of this, because I, you know, I was working really closely with Kevin Brennan at that point, I still do, he's, he's a brilliant, you know, finding a champion in parliament like that is so important. Finding a, a legislator who just gets it I mean, the look of him existing at the moment at which I kind of started doing this is beyond, you know, it's just incredibly lucky. Because there's a group of people in Australia right now who I'm talking to who are working on in a similar, you know, uh, adjacent sort of project. And I think that's some very tangible advice that they could take from this, which is you really do need one strong ally on the inside. Oh, God like like nothing else and you need to get on the inside as well you need right. to get into the, the the mud and figure out the mechanics of you can't be going into any of these situations without understanding which clerk works in what office and who's the guy who speaks to that person and who's actually going to be writing this part and who's going to be writing that part and knowing all of that stuff because you just you have to be across it because there's a million moving parts so they can all and they can all everybody can be influenced right so it's mm. there's politics is a huge influence um, game right he phoned me up actually and said oh it's the uh, private members bill which it's the british parliamentarians are allowed to put in bills for themselves that aren't led by the government um and it's it's done on a lottery and he basically said should i get a lottery ticket and i said Kevin, you should absolutely get a lottery ticket. And he has been, he'd been in Parliament uh, for 22 years and won it for the first time. Oh, incredible. <laughs> yeah. And, and then got, we got to write a private member's bill, basically setting out model legislation of what it would look like if you change British copyright law to help musicians mm. and songwriters, right? So we got to do that, which was brilliant. I helped Kevin bring together like real experts in writing copyright law from around the world. And, you know, cause once you're doing this kind of stuff, these people start coming to you because there's so many people out there who are well-wishing, who want to do this work, who believe in it, who know how to do it. 
and have the expertise to do it. You know, not everybody is on the make out there, right? No, I mean, you sort of like, you play the role of a whistleblower in in a sense, that you're like someone from inside the industry who raises their hand and says, I'm not afraid to be seen in dissent. And that that is like a magnet. Yeah, yeah. And so people came and they helped, and we put together this brilliant thing. And, you know, it never got anywhere, but it forced the government to say, we will deal with this. So, mm. so they stood up in Parliament and said, yes, it's not fair the way that people get paid. And once they've made pronouncements like that, it kind of, there's a certain point where they have to sort of go through with it, right? They're just like a kind of, okay, you've said what you've said, let's get on with it. And so, you know, we're still, we're now two years into that government process. That's still happening. Yeah, it's still happening. Yeah. We just got a, we just got some big, mo- so and I'm, so I'm in this. I should actually explain. Then the government created this. This is the fun. This is where it gets really ridiculous. The government creates this like working group of the entire industry, but it's all like the trade association. So it's like the BPI who represent the majors and lots of little small labels. AIM who represent the independent labels, the musicians union, etc. The Ivers Academy are in there. But me, the broken record guy, I'm not invited because I don't represent anyone. I'm just the asshole who caused the whole problem, right? I'm just, I'm just, this is the, the, even though I'm working with all these organizations, I don't have a role. So then I have to get myself elected as the head of the Ives Academy. Right. (laughs) So that I could be in that room. (laughs) So then I had to go through three elections. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> I had to be elected by the membership to the Senate. Then the Senate had to elect like, me. This to is the- a lot for a penny a play. That's all I'm asking. Right, exactly right. <laughs> then the Senate had to elect me to the board. Then the board had to make me their chair. Wow. And, and then I became the chair of this national association, which I expressly said to them, I, I need to have, you need to give me this position in order to get into this room, in order to negotiate for us, because I'm the guy. So make me the guy right amazing which is really great but it's also hilarious because it means i have have to be a chair of a national organization as well so there's all this other work of like chairing senate meetings and board meetings and being like this other official person on top of the reason why i wanted the job and and i love it but it's not what it's not a thing that i ever thought of myself i've always thought of myself as kind of a back I'm a side man. You know this man about me. Yeah, I'm but it's a, a it's a but it's a means to an end. I mean, I know. this is how I think it is how destiny really works. That there's the idea you have of yourself and your life and everything, and then there's the ways in which you are truly useful to your community and your society. And I think the more noble choice we make as mature adults is to step into the areas that we're useful, not just the ones that fulfill our fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that's exactly right. So I now am the chair of the Ives Academy, which means making a big speech with the Ivan Novello Awards. And being Do you get to wear a special guy. robe and things like that? Because in England, there's a lot of I good really, costumes and regalia. I, <laughs> man, I wish there was a sash or something or a big gold badge. It's, not, it's, it's quite disappointing in that respect. Um, so, so obviously you had this background that prepared you for getting really hands-on with the political side of it. But if you meet young musicians, producers, writers, or even just people that want to be part of the solution, like what can people do to sort of get involved in reshaping the industry? Well, I think there's an important lesson in that. I think it's important to be involved in activism more generally and to understand campaigns more generally, right? Because the specifics of music led campaigns the big the big problem that the music um organizations that i started working with was that they they didn't they weren't very good at agile campaigning they weren't very good at rebuttal they weren't like they didn't have the sort of political nous to get where they needed to be right and i think most musicians are tend to be autodidact right we are that's what we do we teach ourselves shit and we do it and it's just another thing that you can teach yourself right it's just another thing and people shouldn't be afraid of it they shouldn't it, activism it's, it's the mechanics activism. of activism yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and they shouldn't be afraid of it and they shouldn't be afraid and they also shouldn't be afraid of boring functional politics as well like hmm. on any respect and in fact one of the most important lessons is to just really get your head around boring mechanical politics because 
that's where things really change. And, you know, the danger is, as musicians, that we love to protest. You know, we can, you know, go for a march or shout about something, or which is great. Not good with solutions sometimes. Sometimes we don't have any practical solutions. <laughs> which is surprising because, you know, yeah. I think that we're natural problem solvers usually. Yeah. Right? That's kind of what it is. Like, music is a puzzle for me. I know that other people come from different places with this stuff, and, and I'm ADHD or whatever, so it's like I'm, like, always on. But, like, for me, it's a puzzle. And it's like, well, to solve the puzzle, I've got to do this A, B, C, D, and E. Right? And I can see the parts that need to shift. So I'm going to figure out what those parts are and figure out how they work. And then I'm going to apply myself to them, right? And it's boringly as simple as that. <laughs> and I, I, it's, I think that the, 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 with most things, it's the fear of the blank page, right? It's the, it, the fear of the life that doesn't have activism in it, becoming a life of activism, the the knowing that you're going to have to sit in boring meetings right, and try to stay ab absorbing and listening, even though there is absolutely nothing about it that you, you would rather be anywhere else on the planet. That's I tough. think part of it too, yeah, with musicians is we're idealists. Yeah. And sometimes when we get involved in activism, you know, we got pretty involved in the 2020 election just from the perspective of not being particularly passionate about biden but we were damn straight getting trump out of there yeah, um yeah. for for whatever length of time we were able to and i experienced the the positives and the negatives the positives i did get to learn about some of this uh influencing internet dialogue uh how much of the media at that time were on twitter and how much by using hashtags and creating viral conversation, you could actually influence journalists. And the, but the, 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 the downside was that it, it didn't ultimately solve all the problems. As musicians, I think we're such idealists and romantics. We want heaven. We want utopia. We want peace on earth. And you realize that activism never ends. And it's kind of heartbreaking in that sense. In some well, ways, we feel too soft for it. I think I forget who it is. It's someone like Gramsci, but there's a there's a quote um, which is uh, something like pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the soul, right? Beautiful, it, or the spirits, one or the other. I can't remember the exact things, but the the point that there's there's an absolute truth in that. And this is a bit that people always get wrong. They're like, "You're." People say to me, "Tom, you're so negative. You're so negative." I'm like, "Yeah, but." I'm the one pushing forward. Like I'm the one trying to make the progress and I'm yes. the one speaking about the negative stuff. Do you not understand this? This isn't negativity. This is, this is the thing that gives me the compulsion to, to try and change things. Right. Is the negative, right? The knowledge of the negative is what gives me the propulsion forwards. I don't, I'm not facing a wall. I'm just facing a, a challenge. Right. And it's, it's, I think it's, you know, John McCain, a, a man whose politics I didn't particularly love, used to call it the happy soldier, right? Mm. And I think there's a brilliant truth in that, you know, that that's, that's what we all need to be is happy soldiers. There's nothing to be gained from retreating from the world. Yeah, you can create your little piece of, of paradise in your head. And that's, you know, that's true. There's, 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 there's absolute truth in that. There's spiritual truth in that. But the problem is that there's always a transactional loss in doing that. And you're going to feel it no matter what. You're just going to, because we're social beings. And unfortunately, the truth has a, an unfortunate way of catching up with all of us. Maybe there is somebody who can hide forever, but I can't. Yeah, it's how much we're willing to be in reality, too. <laughs> Which is right. not why any of, us, any of us got into music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like John Lennon, right? Silly yeah. bastard, right. wrote Fucking Imagine. An annoying fucking song, right? A beautiful, <laughs> annoying song. But I think there's a brilliant clip of him talking about um, politics where he's saying, you've just got to vote for the, the better one. Because, and I think he says something like, yeah, they might not be a lot better, but that little bit of better is where you will breathe. Mm. that's where you will breathe that's where the fucking air is right and that's why you had to fight for biden right yeah because that little bit is where you fucking get to fucking not suffocate right and it's like i'll take that every day right <sighs> take the place where you're not suffocating right and it's it's, it's it's 
it's but it's really hard for people to feel positive about marginal change, right? But the truth is, is that that's what our lives are, right? It's like, oh, I managed to not fucking be a greedy bastard today. I, you know, I managed to go for a run. I managed to not overreact when my kid made a fucking mess or, you know, life is marginal. It's what it fucking is, right? That, that's so, that's so true. If you were to recommend me talking to one person on this journey of trying to sort of create more dialogue around what is the future of being a musician, is there someone you'd recommend that I talk to? That's a really good question. Besides Paul McCartney. Because <laughs> yeah, then Paul I can get anyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, who would who, be a really different perspective to me, a really like coming at it from a massively different angle would be Matt Dryhurst and Holly Herndon, um, who are working at the absolute edge of like AI and music. And like the thing about obviously what I'm doing is about trying to fix the system that exists based on the very simple principle that work done ought to be remunerated, right? you know where work is made and people benefit the people who have made done the work ought to benefit from the fruit of the <laughs> of that work right it's not a complicated thing that i'm trying to fix and in fact it's what's really problematic about ai arriving at this moment is is that we haven't fixed the basics of that before this other thing comes over the hill right we haven't fixed the fact that musicians get paid properly in the first place never mind the fact they may not be involved in the room <laughs> when when this other when thing the next happens. single's coming out <laughs> exactly right <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. so okay and i great. think that, that i mean yeah. they're hugely and that that i mean they are fiercely intellectual as well in a way that i'm not you know i'm 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 just a i'm just a smart whack-a-mole political type whereas those guys are like They've got their head deep in the books. I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive and uh, learn about them. Thank you for that. And also, are you making any music? Are there, what, what, where do you stand in that sense of things? <laughs> well, I mean, Ben's <laughs> Is there up, time? Big, big Ben Ottywell's always trying to make us make a new Gomez record, which I'm sure will happen eventually. Um, yeah. I've made some, I actually wrote some great songs with E and Ben a few couple of years ago. Had an oh, absolute hoot doing it. Those boys are always fun. Um, yeah. And I missed, seeing them um but uh at the moment i'm writing uh i'm big i've been commissioned by roll doll story company which is actually netflix to bizarrely write a stage musical of one of their books danny cool. champion danny champion of the world so ah oh, amazing that's amazing yeah. yeah um and then i'll i'll link to your twitter and everything but is there anywhere particularly you'd want to drive people to no to not really. About, I, yeah. People always ask. I mean, this is, I always feel bad about the part about the sort of what can I do stuff and where should I go and how should I approach things? Because I'm never sure what the right answer is. It's, it's, and it's a very similar question to, you know, when you get asked, I'm sure you've been asked a million times, what, what advice would you give to young musicians? You know, and it's like, um, well, let me tell you, uh, you know, so just join the Beatles. Um, it's like, you know, the, the problem is, is that, that the answer is, be yourself and be bloody lucky right and 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 there's really not a lot more to it than that i think that the really important thing for people i mean it's not about following me or chasing my shit that doesn't matter at all i'll get on with it no matter what right the the really important thing is that people realize that they can take up space anyone can go into any of these places and take up space and it's fine you know you, you don't need a special passport to speak to a politician. You don't need any of that. You don't, there's nothing special. There's no, there's no magic in it. There's no art to it. There's just going into rooms and befriending people you don't know. That's, that's really all there is to it. And once people realize. It's called a gig. It's called a gig. Yeah. <laughs> It's called a gig, and we've done it a million times. You know, yeah. it's like go into a different room this time without your guitar and just make friends in a different way. It's like it's amazing. It, yeah, I've been so inspired watching the journey of, of everything you're doing play out, and I'm really grateful that you took the time to chat. And I, I do think that, like, for my part, when I was thinking about, yeah, what can I do? How can I be? Because because the reality is that, like. 
yes, when Paul McCartney or Taylor Swift or Ed Sheeran signs onto something, that creates instantaneous massive change. But for us at a smaller level, we've each got to figure out how we can contribute. And I just thought this is a way I can hopefully get people thinking that come up with better solutions than I could come up with. You know? So that's that's the goal. So thanks for being part of that. Oh, mate. Well, thanks anytime. It's just lovely yeah. to see you. I've not seen you. Yeah, good to see you too, ages, man. man.